Well, they didn't want to make it easy. Yeah, I know, but they could have. You know, yeah, that would have been nice. Okay, we're ready. All right, so let's see if we can remember where we are. We're talking about the very tail end of our discussion on generalized linear viscoelastic fluids. Now, I keep summarizing. I, I really hope that, that overall you can remember the, the, the thread of the class. And the thread of the class has been constitutive modeling. And we've done a lot. Uh, we did Newtonian. We did uh, generalized Newtonian. And now we've done uh, generalized linear viscoelastic. So this model is the ultimate that we've got so far. Uh, so there's the Newtonian model, which only handles steady shear, um, excuse me, only uh, handles constant viscosity. The generalized Newtonian fluid model that handles shear thinning but doesn't handle any time dependence. And the generalized linear viscoelastic model that handles time dependence but doesn't handle shear thinning. So we're going to go next on to nonlinear models. And the question is, how yet to improve along this path to get to nonlinear models that will work for the kinds of behaviors that we talked about materials exhibiting? And what I want to show you is that there is something wrong with this model. Now, it's not obvious to us what's wrong with that model. And in fact, it may not be that obvious when I'm done explaining it, because it's kind of a rigorous mathematical problem with the model. But if we can understand what's wrong with the model, it'll give us a clue of how to move forward into getting real nonlinear models. And it's, um, it, it, it is going to work for us. So it's going to turn out that what's wrong with this model has something to do with how strain is measured. So that's the example I want to talk about now, is how I can demonstrate that there's something wrong with this model. And it's kind of a mathematical derivation. So I decided I wasn't going to go through it. It, it takes, you know, it takes a little attention to trigonometry to get the explanation all clear in your mind. And that might take us too long. So I'm just going to go through it. And I started, actually, last period. Um, but at the end of this explanation, what I want you to recognize is that what we're showing is that, that we're violating one of our fundamental precepts of constitutive equations. All these constitutive equations are ways of calculating stress in a fluid. So they need to calculate the stress at every point. Now, all of these equations are written in our um, vector tensor notation. They don't refer to you know, the 1, 2, 3 coordinate system, or the uh, x, y, z, or the r, theta, phi. They're general. We can write them in any coordinate system. And also, they're also meant to be independent of point of view. So whether you're standing up close to the flow or standing far away, or if there's some relative motion between you and the flow. Okay, those things shouldn't matter. And that's what gets violated. So as I said um, before, we're going to consider this situation, kind of an artificial situation, but it's meant to be a simple situation where we look at a flow from two different, very distinct vantage points. So imagine we have a very slow turning turntable. And on that turntable, I have some device producing a shear flow. Now, it may be hard for you to imagine a device that would produce a shear flow. So I've sketched one. This is one that when I was in grad school, uh, Professor Julio Otino had in his laboratory. It's just a big bath, and then you put um, some uh, conveyor belt-like attachments here, conveyor belts, where I'm turning these different cylinders in such a way that this belt goes to the right, this belt goes to the left. So then all of the rest of this is fluid, and the fluid is going to set up a nice shear flow that's going to be stationary in the center. Okay, so this, 
This is just a little device that will do this flow without my hand running out, out of the room, OK? So because I have the conveyor belts running, I've got a con continuous generation of shear flow in the center. Uh, and I can run this thing as long as I want. So that's something to visualize. So now there's going to be a stress generated in here. And I know that, let's say, the stress at this point, you know, it is what it is. And no matter how I calculate it, no matter what coordinate system I pick, I should calculate the stress at this point. And that's the fundamental thing that we want to show. So I'm going to write the stress at all points. In other words, um, I'm going to write the constitutive equation in a coordinate system that's rotating along with the turntable and one that is stationary. So here is my, uh, this is from the handout that you have. OK, and this is what I've just said. So I'm going to be looking at this shear flow from the point of view of two different observers, one rotating with the flow, sitting on the turntable, and one stationary, sitting on the table itself. I should predict the same viscosity for those two calculations. Those two observers should observe the same viscosity. So I'm going to call the coordinate system that's on the turntable the bar coordinate system. And I'm going to call the coordinate system that's not on the turntable the uh, regular XYZ coordinate system. And I'm going to calculate the viscosity that's predicted by the generalized linear viscoelastic model using those two points of view. Now I can regenerate uh, the calculation that's on your notes very easily for the case in the x, y, z coordinate system. This is the coordinate system that's on the turntable. And so just like any prediction of material function, we know the velocity field, which means we know the rate of deformation tensor. So everything here is just predicting viscosity like normal, OK? Because I'm on the cord, I'm on the turntable and so I'm just I'm just looking at this flow it doesn't matter that anything's rotating and so there you go there's a shear flow and I calculate it as normal so it, as it says in your notes we start with the velocity vector we create gamma dot tensor we write down our constitutive equation we put in the gamma dot tensor and this allows us to predict tau 2, 1. So tau 2, 1 is this integral with just the tau 2, 1 component present. So that's this equation here. Okay? So that's the constitutive equation with just the tau 2, 1 component. So this is tau 2, 1. And I can then divide it by, uh, take the mine negative of it, divide it by gamma dot, and I get the viscosity. So this is an integral over this unknown function of our constitutive equation. And so I did a little change of variable, but in any case, it comes out to be this very simple integral. The integral from 0 to infinity of the function g over the variable s. Okay? This is actually in your homework to do this calculation. Okay? So if this part's not clear, you're going to get a chance to try it yourself as well. So this is prediction of the viscosity for a generalized linear viscoelastic fluid using the shear coordinate system, the, the right-hand rule, XYZ coordinate system that's sitting in the center where the one direction is the flow, the two direction is the gradient, and the three direction is neutral. Very, very simple. Okay, so that's, that's the easy one. That's on that. And now I should be able to pick any observer and get that same result. So now the second observer is off the turntable. So that means over here somewhere, I have the shear coordinate system, and it's rotating. But my observer is over here. Okay? So this is my x, y, z coordinate system. This is my x. Actually, I've already messed up. This is my x bar, y bar system. This one is my regular x, y coordinate system. And I'm now going to keep track of this flow that's rotating. The whole thing is rotating from the point of view of this coordinate system. So imagine I pick some point 
and I want to know something about that point, I need to know the velocity at that point. Okay? So the velocity at that point is going to be the velocity of the rotation plus the velocity in the flow. This is what's in your handout. The, vo the velocity vector with respect to the stationary frame is just the velocity vector with respect to the rotating frame plus the velocity of the frame itself. So that breaks down our problem. If I want to know what the velocity is written in this coordinate system, it's going to be the sum of the velocity vector of this coordinate system, which is some sort of a tangential velocity vector, and the velocity vector that is inside the flow itself, which are these vectors. Okay, so for instance, at this point, it's going to be the sum of this vector, which is the velocity at that point, plus the velocity, plus the vector that gives this sort of, let's say, tangential velocity vector that expresses the rotation of this whole system. The velocity with respect to the rotating frame is easy. This is that same shear velocity vector, uh, gamma dot y, zero, zero. Okay? This is the same as this right here. Gamma dot y in the ex bar direction and then the velocity of the frame. So once we write this vector v, we should be able to take del v, del v transpose, put it into the constitutive equation and predict the stress, written from the point of view of this observer. So our job turns out to be a coordinate transformation, which we talked about a few weeks ago. We have to write this y bar in terms of x and y, and we have to write this unit vector in terms of the unit vectors for the xy coordinate system. And then we need to write the velocity of the frame of reference. This is all, in the end, um, trigonometry. Okay? So to write the frame velocity, here's, here's my, I'm sitting now on the turntable. The velocity of the frame of reference, so if I pick some location r, uh, it's rotating at the angular velocity omega. And so at time t equals zero, it's back here along the x-axis. And then as t goes on, this thing rotates around. That's the rotation of the turntable. So at any point, the instantaneous velocity of the frame of reference is the tangential velocity. And you can do some geometry here. This is omega t, and so that's omega t, so that's the complement of omega t, so that's omega t. And you can write the velocity of the frame in terms of sine omega t is going to be related to the x part. So it's r uh, times this component, omega sine omega, r omega times sine omega t. And then a negative because you see it's in the negative x direction. And then the cosine is this part here. That's in the positive y direction. And then the, uh, the, the Linear velocity is r omega, and the component is this component, which is cosine omega t. The total magnitude of the velocity is r times omega. That comes from physics. When you have an angular velocity, the velocity at a point is the radius to the, uh, to the uh, axis of rotation times the angular velocity. So this, this vector has magnitude r omega, you know, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, so that works. And this is how it's written in the xy coordinate system. So that part we want to put in for v frame. We actually don't really want this in terms of cosine omega t sine omega t, though. We want it in terms of the uh, coordinate system xy. I've subtracted off the position x naught y naught, which is the location of this point, and I've translated uh, this over here, so I don't have to take into account that difference. And I can relate sine omega t cosine omega t by more trigonometry. So here it is in terms of x and y. So now I've translated the coordinate system. There's the omega t. There's my r. 
there's my velocity vector. Uh, r omega t is equal to the y coordinate of a point, excuse me, r sine omega t is equal to the y minus y naught coordinate. Um, that sine, cosine is this distance, so that's equal to x minus x. If we substitute these two expressions into our original, we get our final result for the velocity of the frame, which is in terms of just the x, y, z coordinate system, no hat, no bars. Okay, now if that, if that uh, went by really fast, that's understandable. Like I said, to really get this, you'd have to sit there and look very closely and think about the trig. The overall idea, though, is just that this should be a velocity, a tangential velocity that's going around in a circle. And that's what this is. And it's written in this stationary coordinate system, which is located on the table. So I'm going to plug that back in here and add it to the velocity of the fluid that is the prescribed velocity in the flow. Now to add these two things together, they have to be in the same coordinate system. This one's not in the same coordinate system. This is in the bar coordinate system. So I have to do some little bit of, uh, again, geometry to convert this unit vector and this coordinate um, direction into the x, y coordinate system so that I can add them up. And that requires this sketch. which is a little bit distorted on that screen, uh, correct in your handout. And for sure, I know that when I've uh, lectured and actually gone through this entire derivation, it takes, again, a, a quite a bit of engagement to figure out the geometry. So don't expect that much of it yourself. But what we can do with these various geometric constructs, here's omega t again. This coordinate system is the rotating one. So at time t equals 0, it's here and it's rotating at an angular frequency of omega. So at time omega t, it's at some location, which I've drawn there. So this angle is omega t. A point in our fluid can be written either in this coordinate system or this one, and that's what all the lines are about. If I write it in this coordinate system, it's at position x minus x naught, y minus y naught. If I write it in this coordinate system, it's at position x bar, that's this length, y bar, that's that length. And then with all these various lines and these distances, we can relate them together. Okay, so for instance, the distance a, which is right here, is equal to x minus x naught cosine omega t. So x minus x naught is the x coordinate of point p, so that's this distance. This distance is the hypotenuse of this triangle here. Okay, and so if this is omega t, this is sine times hypotenuse, this is cosine, so there you go. It's the hypotenuse, which is x minus x naught times uh, cosine of this angle, omega t gives you a. So, you know, it's just geometry, and we get these four pieces. And we can use those pieces to write our velocity vector. Okay, this is the velocity vector. Gamma naught uh, y bar e x bar in terms of this coordinate system. So that's what we did. And um, the details are in the notes. Y bar is in terms of cosine and sine omega t. Uh, e x bar is also in terms of cosine and sine omega t. But everything else is in terms of y, x, or E X E Y. We've gotten rid of all the bar business. Okay. So now we put it all together. Okay. So if that part was disengaging you, I hope you'll re-engage because this part is the rheology. Okay. That part was transformation of coordinate system. And now we put it together. So overall, we said we wanted the velocity with respect to the stationary coordinate system is equal to the, this is the shear flow, and this is the rotating frame of reference. We just worked on these, so we picked them off the previous slides. Here's the shear flow. This first part, there's gamma naught. This first part is y bar. This second part is ex. 
And then here is that V frame. Now, when I multiply these out, this is a whole bunch of stuff times EX plus a, a whole bunch of stuff times EY. So this EX part is seen here. There's an EX part here, and there's an EY part here. So I just gather up all of the things that are multiplied by EX, and I put them in the X position. Gather up all the parts that are uh, multiplied by EY and put them in the EY position, and the same with EZ, which is 0. So for instance, it's cosine omega t times all this stuff out front, so there's all that stuff. That term's in EY, so that doesn't go minus omega y minus y naught. So all of this is the EX term. So we've now finished. We've written the velocity with respect to the stationary frame, and there it is. So now we can predict viscosity. To predict viscosity, we need gamma dot, del V, del V transpose. And here's the uh, answer, and here's where we would get it. We're just going to take partial derivative with respect dVx dx. So this is Vx. When we take the derivative with respect to x, this is out front. No x's, no x's. There's an x times sine omega t. So I get sine omega t times minus 1 times cosine omega t times gamma dot. So that's here. Sine omega t times minus 1 times cosine omega t times gamma dot. So that's all that's happening. Taking the partial of vx with respect to x, vx with respect to y, v, vy with respect to x, vy with respect to y. Just looking for where those x's and y's are. Everything has already been translated into only in terms of x and y. So there's del v. Del v transpose, we just flip the rows and the columns. When we add them together, uh, we get twice this and twice that. And we get this plus this in those two positions. When we add these two together, the omegas go out. Okay. So this is sine squared omega t. So it's going to be when I add these two together, when I add del V and del V transpose, I'll get gamma dot naught sine squared omega, uh, cosine, omega cosine, omega, cosine squared omega t minus sine squared omega t. So it's two times the diagonal ones, and then cosine squared minus sine squared in these two positions. So we've got gamma dot now. We can make it a little neater by recognizing that this is the sine of twice an angle. This is the cosine of twice an angle. So I can make them look a little neater. But nevertheless, we're done with that part of the calculation. Now we need to predict the viscosity. And there's one tricky part here. So we've got gamma dot. And now we want to predict the viscosity. And to predict the viscosity, we needed to put in the velocity vector for velocity, which we did for um, shear flow, which we did. Calculate gamma dot, which we did. Okay. But we actually already sort of made our lives complicated. Because when we predict viscosity, we usually, this is the velocity vector, this is the gamma dot, and then we take the stress constitutive equation, minus infinity to t, g of t minus t prime, gamma dot, t prime, dt prime. Plug it in, get tau to 1 from that equation, take minus it, divide it by gamma naught, and I get the viscosity. That's normally how we predict viscosity. We've kind of thrown a runky, monkey wrench into the situation by not having this as our velocity vector. Okay. We stepped off the turntable, and we calculated this monster of a velocity vector. And this velocity vector is not equal to the one that we need it to be in order to calculate viscosity. 
So we can't just say it's wrong when we plug it in because we're not starting with the same, uh, we're not starting with the same velocity. But we can revert back to the same velocity we started with if we set time equal to zero. Because at time equal to zero, this coordinate system is located right at this location. Okay? So that's the only last trick. Okay? So this summarizes this in the handout. To predict the viscosity, we need tau to one. So it's the stress in the shear coordinate system. This definition is tied to the shear coordinate system, but our new coordinate system is not a shear coordinate system except at time t equals zero. So we're going to carry out this calculation and then take t equal to zero just as a check. Okay? So here's our, here's our gamma dot. We're going to calculate stress with this gamma dot. Tau 2, 1 is this term. Uh, it's going to be related to this term, uh, gamma dot naught cosine 2 omega t, but then we're going to let time go to zero for our double check. That's tricky. All right, so here's the prediction of tau y x. Here's the constitutive equation. There's our um, generalized linear viscoelastic fluid. I pick this, two, this uh, y x component off of our result here and I put that in. So it's a G of S times uh, gamma dot naught cosine 2 omega T prime, and then I substituted that T prime is equal to T minus S. And now we've got the stress. To get tau 2, 1, we say that t is equal to 0. So there's our result. We set t equal to 0. We take the negative of it. There was a minus sign out front, so that's gone. We divide it by gamma dot naught, so those cancel. And we predict that the viscosity is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of g of s cosine omega s ds. Now, originally, when we did it the simple way, we got that it was just the integral of g of s ds. No mention of the angular velocity. This one has a, a viscosity that depends on the angular velocity. So it's a, a bit of a long derivation, uh, but it's the simplest example where we can see that something about Choosing a coordinate system that allows rotation is messing up our constitutive calculation. It's, imp it's implying that it matters how this relative rotation is taking place, and that's just not true. Okay, so our conclusion at the end of the day is, is that the generalized linear viscoelastic equation is not invariant to change of reference frame, change of your point of view. And that's called, it's not frame invariant. Okay, that's a mathematical description of the properties of the equation. And all of our stresses need to be frame invariant. Okay, so this is, this is a critical flaw in this model. So it's kind of odd because we spend all this time on this model and I've certainly implied that it's a useful model, and it is, uh, as long as we use it within proper um, range of values, and we'll talk about that. So this problem is going to be our, uh, to our advantage in a minute because we're going to use this problem to fix the model and go on to nonlinear models. So here's the deal with the generalized linear viscoelastic constitutive equation. Uh, we're very happy with it because it is a first constitutive equation with memory, time-dependent effects. We were able to calculate g prime and g double prime and g of t, g prime and g double prime and g of t, and we can match the data using the generalized Maxwell model very, very well. We can get a gradual uh, buildup of stress in a startup experiment. It's not that hard to calculate with. Stress is on the left. Everything else on the right is kinematics. 
Uh, and it can be used to calculate what I call the linear viscoelastic spectrum, which is all those uh, relaxation times or uh, viscosity parameters or modulus parameters. It's a little disappointing. We got memory in there, but we didn't get the shear normal stresses. Uh, we got a constant viscosity. And we have this, we, in the case of the generalized Maxwell model, we added up all the strains. So it's only going to be good when additive strains are um, correct. And now we've just shown something that seems to negate everything, uh, that in fact it's mathematically ill-posed. It's a mathematically incorrect equation. Um, I'm just asking you to hang on on this. We're going to use this to our advantage. All right. So now we are on chapter nine. Okay. Chapter nine is taking off into the future uh, of nonlinear constitutive equations. And our taking off point is going to be exactly this problem, the problem of frame invariance in the generalized linear viscoelastic model. We know that there's something wrong with the model, and we know that there's this something has to do with this rotation business. Okay? And what it turns out to be is that this rotation introduces an artificial strain. If I'm on the turntable, and I see a flow taking place, then the relative displacement of two particles, from my point of view, if I'm rotating with the, with the flow, I don't notice the rotation because I'm rotating too. When I'm standing off the turntable, and now these particles are moving far apart, they're moving far apart, but they're also rotating. So they're kind of an extending spiral, these particles, as they move around. That, it turns out that there is an implicit measurement of strain in the generalized linear viscoelastic model by its form. And we can make that form apparent with a little bit of mathematical manipulation. So let me just uh, summarize that. We're going to be talking about advanced constitutive equations, which is what we've been building up to, and in particular, nonlinear finite strain. The generalized linear viscoelastic model is only good for infinitesimally small strain. Now we're going to talk about flows where the strain is non-zero or not small. The generalized linear viscoelastic model has a problem, and it has to do with its strain measure. And I'm going to show you that by uh, showing you what the strain measure is in this model. So this is my question that I want to address. What is the strain measure of this model? This is strain rate. What is the strain? Actually, we never talked about strain. Well, we didn't, I, would, I shouldn't say we never talked about it. When we did the Maxwell model, we talked about um, springs and dash pots. And springs kind of have strain in them. There's a strain. Stress is proportional to strain for strings. And vis the viscous dash pots, the stress is proportional to the rate. But when we went from the Maxwell model to the generalized Maxwell model, we hit a lot of that stuff inside G of T. And we only ended up with the strain rate showing up, no strain. So we're going to have to do, use a little bit of mathematical magic, I guess, to reveal what the strain is. And maybe, maybe you can see 
that I can actually do an integration by parts on this and get a strain to show up. If this is a strain rate, remember integration by parts involves differenti differentiating one part and integrating the other. So when I integrate the strain rate part, I'm going to get a strain. And that's how I'm going to show you what the strain measure is. We can show what strain measure is used by performing integration by parts. OK, so that's back to calculus. Tau equals minus the integral from minus infinity to t, g of t minus t prime, gamma dot of t prime, dt prime. Integration by parts, the integral of u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. So if I have limits a, b, I have to do limits a, b here. OK, so let's see. Integral of u dv, I want to uh, I want to differentiate the g and integrate the strain rate so that I get a strain. So I'll make dv equal to gamma dot, I'll call it um, the integral of gamma dot dummy variable, dt dummy variable, and then u I'll call g. dt prime. Oh, excuse me. That's not right. I got the dt over here already. OK, the integral of u dv. Oh, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm doing this wrong here. Yeah, I'm doing this wrong here. Start over. Okay, integral of u is g, and dv is equal to gamma dot t double prime, d, or gamma dot t prime dt prime, let's say. And so du is equal to dg dt prime uh, dt prime. And V is equal to the integral of gamma dot, which I'm going to put the dummy variable in now, T prime. And I'm going to put as my limits uh, a reference time, which I'm going to make T. That's a choice of mine, uh, to the variable T prime which is the variable, the variable I'm going for. This expression, the integral of gamma dot between two limits, is the definition of the strain tensor gamma between those times. This is called the infinitesimal strain tensor. OK, let's see if I've done that right. Integral of u dv, so that's these two terms here, is equal to, OK, now I have to calculate the du is equal to dg dt prime dt prime. Uh, dv I integrate, and I'm integrating it between a reference time and a time, because strain is always between some reference time and some other time of interest. And so that's uh, 
of, over this dummy variable, and that by definition is the infinitesimal strain tensor. And now I need to plug them back into this integral of u dv is u v minus the integral of v du. So I need much more space here than I actually have. Let's see how this works. So the integral of u dv is equal to u v minus the integral of v du. So that means uh, if I take my minus side off to the left so that I don't lose it, now I've got the integral of u dv. This is minus infinity to t of g gamma dot. Integral of u dv is equal to, from my previous sheet, u, which is g, v, which is gamma, evaluated between the limits, minus infinity and t, minus the integral of v, v is gamma, du. du is partial g with respect to t prime dt prime. Okay, so the integral for, of u dv is u v minus the integral of v du. Now this, this term goes away. Uh, when I evaluate it at time t, I get the strain from t to t. So what's the strain when I don't actually move? This is zero. And as long as this isn't infinity, that upper limit goes away. So this is the modulus at times t equals zero, probably not infinity. So the upper limit goes away. The lower limit is the strain at infinity, at, um, the strain between uh, t, uh, time t and time minus infinity times uh, the, the g value at infinity, t minus minus infinity is g of infinity. So as long as this is finite, this is zero, that goes away as well. So there are some assumptions there, but this term goes out. And we end up with a new constitutive equation. It's the same old one, actually, but it looks a little different. Now we have stress equals, and see I have a minus sign on the left and a minus side here, so I'm going to get a positive sign, plus the integral from minus infinity to t of partial g with respect to t prime gamma t t prime dt prime. This is the generalized linear viscoelastic model strain explicit. Strain explicit version. This function here, the partial derivative of g, is called the memory function. So the memory function is the partial derivative of g with respect to t prime. And the strain measure now shows up here as the infinitesimal strain measure. And here's my observation to you. It's the use of the infinitesimal strain tensor in the generalized linear viscoelastic model that is causing the frame variance, the inability of the model to be independent of frame rate when, when it's used in that constitutive equation. So we can, um, we can show that uh, by considering what this model predicts when we have a very simple rotation just a block of fluid that we rotate by an angle psi. Okay? So if we, if we take a block of fluid and rotate it by just an angle psi, 
then what we need to calculate is what is the infinitesimal strain tensor for that rotation. We can then plug it into this model and we should be able to predict the stress. And we, what we want it to predict is that there's no change in the state of stress between those two states. If I just take a block of rubber and rotate it, there's no stress. If I take a strained block of rubber where there is a stress and hold it at that strain and rotate it, there's no additional stress. So what I'd really like is that uh, this device, this, this math that I want to use to describe this rotation uh, should be independent of this, this little rotation. So in order to calculate such a thing, we have to examine this strain tensor gamma. So I'll put the conclusion here. Uh, the infinitesimal strain tensor is the problem. Okay, so next time I'm going to talk about the infinitesimal strain tensor and we're going to calculate it for this flow and it can be related, uh, the str infinitesimal strain tensor, to very simple tensor formulation, the displacement tensor plus its transpose, where this displacement tensor uh, is based on this displacement vector, which is just the uh, motion of particles between two times. So if, if I take the, the location of a particle at time t prime and subtract the location of that particle at time t, that gives me the displacement vector. If I can calculate those displacement vectors for this motion, I can calculate the u. If I can calculate the u, I can take these gradients and the transpose. We know how to do that. And that gives us the strain. If we then uh, get that strain, we can put it into the constitutive equation and make a prediction of what the stress will be. We won't need to talk about what g is because really this strain measure is either going to say that there's a dependence on the rotation or there's not. When we properly fix this problem, the strain, when it's properly measured uh, between these two states, is the identity tensor. There's been no change in strain. When it's incorrect, it's going to be a function of the angle psi. Okay, so what we're going to see is when we go through this calculation for the rotation is that it is a function of the psi and therefore incorrect. Then we, we've got a path forward. We need a measure of strain that will not make this mistake. And what we will introduce is something called the finite uh, deformation tensors. And those tensors are going to be a measure of relative position of two particles. And what we'll see is when we put them through this same test, they'll pass. They won't, uh, they won't predict any dependence on gamma, on psi. They'll predict that the tensor you need to put in here for strain is the identity tensor. And so whatever the stress was in the initial state is going to be the stress in the final state, which is correct. Okay. Once we fix this strain measure, we're going to have a new constitutive equation. Once we have a new constitutive equation, we can test its predictions. And uh, what's going to turn out to be the case is that we're going to get a constitutive equation that will be a very reasonable finite strain constitutive equation at that point. Okay, so that's where I'll pick up um, on Friday is with calculating that strain measure for this simple case of the rotation.